Well, you can read that stuff there. Um, when I write, I often like to adopt the imagined voice of somebody else. Uh, when I do that, I'll often write in the first person. And when I'm writing about myself, I'll often use third person. And I guess, um, you know, Carolyn, I think it was mentioned that the importance of seeing and so many uh, better poets than I have mentioned the importance of paying attention. Well, I think another benefit of poetry is to imagine the other in this very divisive time where we demonize the other. Um, empathy and imagination are very useful to us for politics and, and the civic sphere, but also I think they're critical if you're going to write poetry or maybe just to be a human. Uh, picking up the Halloween theme, I, I pick spirits as my overall theme. Uh, All Hallows Eve and the return of the dead and their spirits haunting us. Frankly, I welcome the spirits of the dead coming back to me. Um, this is a poem soon to be published by uh, the Valley Review called Natural Supernaturalism. The night was a rain of dead stars when I slept with the two eyes of the golden cat. A goblet of dry wine sat beside the book of the Egyptian dead who put on animal faces like the betrayers of my deceits. I heard with my eyes as the rain of long dead light fell and the cat purred her indifference having been fed on my hope. There used to be a woman here sitting on my pillow, but I may have imagined her. The streets guttered with fragile light that had aged past galaxies into the eddies that leaves sailed. The golden cat had golden eyes. She blinked and night came and went with simple time. It was a good, bad evening. My dreams woke me several hours in each minute, my head aching from the bend of gravity in shape of a cat. My name was silence to her. She meditated on that for what may have been my lifetime. A wind was in my throat, and I spoke its gestures of space. The cat sang more silence. The dry wine bled the glass. The book opened itself, but I was too tired to hear. I may have imagined that, too. So I'm not sure who this guy is. Uh, I have not divorced Linda. She is still here, so I'm not alone, as this particular person is. Um, but uh, I'm imagining um, somebody who is living in a place between dream and reality here. The latest collection I have, Dark Fathers, is about my father and his father. And my sister who is an artist actually did the cover art that the publisher uh, adopted for the cover. This poem was originally published in Weary Blues, Apparitions. Fathers who have died try their hand as ghosts, naming from the grave their sons still asking for proof of love, still asking for an acceptance they never had themselves as sons, nor could give as fathers 
even from the grave still. Uh, the full on face that's the bigger picture is my grandfather uh, who came from Syria, uh, Elias Schlemen, over a hundred years ago, uh, came over as a peddler and uh, no, the streets weren't made of gold. Emerging from him is my father with that kind of enigmatic smirk on it. Uh, this particular poem was about a time when he and I were not getting along particularly well. And um, we were blessed that we both forgave ourselves and each other for being human. And the last decade and a half, we became friends. Uh, this poem was written after he had died, Harrowing Hallow's Evening. I am sorry, but I cannot believe you in your total absence from everywhere, except in resurrections of dreams. I am sorry that I witnessed your body, gaping mouth from loosing soul to its escape wherever it goes now. I am sorry that I touched a cold shell that was not you. Mm. Although you had once been so cold and rigid in your living, you were not so when you fell back into your death chair while playing with the children in your store. I am sorry it has been seven years that I have hoped to reawaken you to your deep voice and lighter smiles. Today, Halloween, your favorite of holidays, I look into the masks of every ringer of our, our door and hope to see your black eyes filled with sparks of laughter, pretending that you do not now wear death as your ever costume. I am sorry that as I go to sleep, I still am trying to let you go so you can lay the path I have to follow in my own way. If you can, make the way clear, as once you did, holding my hand along dark streets, showing me the tricks of shadows on older All Saints' Eves, when spirits rose and memories were made, I am sorry that I still jump at such old ghosts. <laughs> he did, lo did love Halloween. <laughs> um, when Linda and I built our current home and uh, it first moved in, we were blessed by four species of woodpeckers, including the pileated. <laughs> and as the pileated uh, visited us, sitting out on the back porch, um, I suddenly had the feeling somehow that this particular bird embodied the spirit of my father and this particular poem came from that, pileated. <laughs> His hand is in the rapid hammering as if his touch still carpentered my world, shaping with router and bandsaw the wood that grew from the black humus. His eyes in the black seeing centered in this flying, aimed at fulfilling hunger from what tunnels or bores into the trees, just as his sight straightened the cut with right angles measured by steel square. His voice is in the near mad laughter of being freed into feathers, unknowing forever in the reincarnation of spring from migrations beyond these woods. Like the gentleness of his wit became when he had moved three times past death I sit on our porch each morning, waiting his return from the night 
as a shadow flying from nothing into the something of my seeing, hearing. His presence is fantastic, like the brief half memory of last night's dream before the sunlight chases it into the very darkest green. Uh, that's the last picture I have of the two of us together there. We're not seeing these pictures. Uh, I mentioned my grandfather. Uh, did, I never knew him. He had died before I was born. Um, learned about him from other relatives. And I wrote this poem uh, as best I could as a short biography, you might say. The Syrian. His dark brow and darker eyes, wearied of peddling hope across foreign streets, his English, gutturaled with Arabic phonemes, made it a hard sell at Cerberus doorways, eyed by Hungarians, Poles, and Germans. In poor streets of Safita and homes, he'd heard the promises of gold in some America that did not exist except in glitters of deceit. Now he walked snowed streets from West Newton to Pittsburgh, drinking his profit as fast as the wind drove ice into his stranger face, dragging a cart clattering emptiness in pots and promises. Um, my grandfather was married to, obviously, my grandmother, who my grandfather was in his mid-20s when a 15-year-old was brought over by her mother in an arranged marriage. And um, her name was Nejme Daoud, which translates Star David, Star of David. They were Christian Arabs. From her, I got my first name. Um, she was married. She had, uh, at 15, had seven kids, uh, lived to almost 100, uh, never had a day of school because we obviously don't waste education on women, do we? At least that was uh, true then and unhappily is still true in many places in this world. Uh, but there was no doubt who was in charge of the family. Let me tell you that. Um, this is uh, remembering a visit to the grave with, um, you know, I always am willing to tell some, some lies about the, the actual facts in order to make a better story, but it's, it's true even if it's not exactly factual. Nejme, last passage. This was originally published by Artemis. Thank you, Artemis. I stand beside her modest stone, my finger tracing the shallow cut of her name in search of epitaph. None speaks except the cry of Jay from the ripe branch of mulberry. A vase of fading roses lies toppled. Down the hill and to the left, her husband's gravestone has weathered over four decades, lying flat in unmown grass. Her seven children are buried on seven other hillsides in this and two other states. My father is among those dead, his stone as modest as his father's. A petal of memory wakes my silent senses, the aroma of roses and Syrian bread perfumes this green hill with false scent. I brought only hunger, hunger with me. I feel her fingers curling my dark hair with Syrian tails twisting with gentle strength. From her, I learned to knead life into this bread of dreams. I pray the words she prayed in the tongue she learned. 
I am the guardian of this new land she lies within. The jay has left a silent mulberry tree. She had a beautiful rose garden. She and my dad had the green thumbs of all green thumbs. And um, I do remember as, I don't know, maybe a six, seven year old sitting at her feet while she played with my hair. Uh, my mom uh, also made it almost to 100. Uh, on that side, I'm also the grandson of peasants. In my mom's case, they came from, from Poland. The last name of K-O-N, which in my ignorance, I thought must have been abbreviated until I met a Polish scholar who let me know that K-O-N basically meant horse. And so at some point in the past, my ancestors took care of horses for richer nobles. Uh, this was originally in Red Earth Review. It was written after she died. The last bend in the Huron River. Uh, we lived uh, for quite a time and she lived until she died in Michigan, a little town of Belleville along the Huron River. Uh, and she had a soft spot for every animal and every stray. The skitter and claw of squirrel run and paw while an acorn drops as if manna. The chitter and scree of sparrow and jay demanding the feeder to be filled. The softest eyed doe and hesitant spotted fawn unfolding from foliage and morning mist. The burst of mallard from spraying flight from a dark time of water in the quiet cove. All show me the way to earliest horizon's fire and to you beyond all that you had so cared for. Pipe of ghosted smoke. Um, I found out a very good friend of mine, Bill Shooter, had died. Uh, I had not been in touch with him for two or three years. Shame on me. And I had met him when I was an undergraduate. He was a professor. He, if you saw him walking down the street with a, you know, a tweed jacket with patches and a pipe and a full beard, you would have said English professor, and that's what he was. But he was so much more. And so I, I imagined going back to uh, his place after he was gone. And from that, this poem. Incense clothed me in an aisle of remembering, incense of a dark church, incense of tobacco smoke. He turned his faith my way and spoke in Greek and Aramaic as I shrugged off his forgetting his own birthday was the day before mine. Writing poetry is not the same as reading Peter. No, we crossed those words when New Year's Eve welcomed us with an agnostic recitation of Wallace Stevens and red wine. His monk's condo wore walls of horizontal books and he laid his hand on one I had neglected to read. Do you remember the index or the rare book room on the ninth level? Before I could answer, he decided that Rome and New York were both empty now, wrapped in the odors of it all as if in greasy butcher paper. Outside the snow phantom to the earth in careful, quiet, crystals. We all most live until we don't. The light behind him, his gray beard like gray dust haloing his red lips, as if a pipe still hung there, drifting with silence. So late, too late, his glands defeated, his life force unjuiced, 
and as still as a song etched into unplayed vinyl, sheathed into its musty sleeve. Somewhere the train I wanted has missed its station. Midnight paused us between days, and I looked for the flowers that I should hold. I walked the hallway to his kitchen where cheese and bread and olive oil would have been plated for this holiest of secular satyrs, this mass of empty syllables spoken in an English with no dictionary. When I turned back, he was absent, like a shadow gone when too much light casts itself into the darkest corner of a cold room. I sat into his reading chair, tasted the perfume of his burnt tobacco, and looked hard into hands prayerful of empty smoke. He did speak or uh, read multiple languages. The quotes are imagined and they refer to different parts of his life, which we can talk about some other day, maybe over a glass of wine while reading Wallace Stevens. Uh, this is the most recent of the poems. Uh, it's scheduled to be in a collection, Tales from Six Feet Apart. It's obvious where it came from, but I'll mention the obvious anyway. I was like you watching the news as COVID started really hitting in the spring. Unfortunately, it seems to be hitting maybe even worse now. And I watched in New York uh, aerial photos or videos rather of people taking corpses out and putting them into reefers because there were so many of them. And I thought of Charon and Dante and from that experience and thinking came this poem, imagining what it would be like to be one of those people and speaking in his or her voice. I dress myself in plastic, shield my face with clear plastic, cover my mouth with the plastic foam of an N95 mask as I gurney the blue plastic cocoons that carry the dead to their soil metamorphosis. There are so many dead. I had not thought so many to be undone so quickly, drowning in the ocean their lungs made. The morgue has no place for them. So we manger them in refrigerated trailers parked side by side in the parking lot. Many are claimed by families, buried in secret ceremonies attended by a few who stand spaced out too far to clutch at comfort. The rest city workers will take unclaimed to a pauper's field. I fall asleep on a plastic bench that stands against a sterile wall until startled awake by bleeding alarms or the tired voice of a nurse or an orderly asking me to take out the dead. We all fear the air, the wind, the touch of flesh to our flesh, the clearing of someone's throat that might presage the disease. We all walk weary, stumbling steps. I am the servant of the gurney more than its master. Its wheels rattle a martial echo through the halls, parting any who may walk their white way. Only the dead have seen the end of this war, and there are so many more. Um, this is kind of a stream of consciousness poem, remembering um, all, the, all the things that are gone, except in my memory, uh, five cherry trees 
behind a house that I lived in when I was a child and elm trees that I lived down when I was, and around the house I lived in when I was a teenager and so on. As tart cherries are still sweet. Mistaken and waken, waking to an old room, an old house vacated of the same remembered colors, but waking nonetheless in some sound startled from those dreams, sunlight at the wrong window, slanting an old way, but off kilter, too angled low or too rose or too much in the eyes to allow sleep in its rekindling mistakes all lost as a dog who tickled me with his nose and puppy wriggling is lost to a daydream paler than ghosts in the night remembering me now perhaps if memories can remember the living we are as quick as this sunlight at dawn now lost as well in its rising room darkening as the shadows of Dutch elms long diseased and long hewn to their absence there, now, here, now with the echoes of my old dog barking lonely from his pen up on the hillside where the five black cherry trees no longer grow thick with so many hungry birds. And last, this is from a, probably the most autobiographical collection, uh, Coda, the Geese Wade Up River, uh, based again on memories, the return of spirits via memories. The V of Canada geese slide downward, then on V and single file glide into the water, sledding white sprays of water like silver snow outward. Behind me, the young boy walks, perhaps a half a mile away, falling further and farther behind. He stops often to toss a stone at the water, wanting so much that his ripple circle making carry the world over. At each bend, I try to wait for him to catch up, but finally have to walk onward downstream. Each time he turns the bend himself, he gets harder and harder to see. He seems to shrink up into the green willows that lean over the water, dangling branches into the current as the boy would dangle a fishing line. The geese have hunkered down for the night as the sun leans upriver. They preen and fluff feathers, nesting themselves into the reeds and weed along the shoreline near sunset water. They cackle their evening gaggle talk, sliding into darkness with a friendly communion. Ahead of me, around the curve of the river path, I keep catching glimpses of the old man. He may be the boy's grandfather, pausing regularly, waiting out the boy's playful explorations until he comes home. His gray hair and beard, his vulture stoop at the shoulders, his steady but slow stride, rising like a farmer to step across the furrows. At each bend in the river, I see more of him. Steadily, I am catching up. I worry about the boy, since I can no longer see him in the redefining dusk. It is a quiet sunset and the geese are out of the sky. I guess I should do this one for Halloween. Um, 
I met, this began with seeing paper bags drifting like spirits in trees. Ghosts, paper or plastic? Hold it. There are more ghosts and shadows than we think. See, there at the corner of sight and darkness, twitching for remembrance. All minds meld after disillusion, but something of their shadows lasts, remains where light breaks from particle to wave around hard corners of interference. So in city streets, spirits hover in sighs and losses compounded. The wind blows the loons of forlorn plastic bags to ghost comic our expectation. We diminish after sunset and become blind to old starlight. It has traveled so far to dim shadows while morning is distant. But what is that? Just out of the corners that eyes make, twitching for remembrance. Okay, and uh, that's my advertising slide. And as with the others, uh, you can certainly email me, davidanthonysam at gmail.com uh, and can uh, get you a signed personalized copy if you'd like. Uh, you can go to davidanthonysam.com bookstore and um, that will get you to prolific books or Amazon or whatever. And if you do have a copy, I will be happy to sign one in a way that's safe for both of us. Thank you all.